Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We record the show every week as we are doing today and it is available on our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show uh, where to go to access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Um, in other states, it might be just your you know, so-and-so state library. Um, so we provide services, training, consulting, uh, grants to all types of libraries. So you will find things for all types of libraries on our show. Uh, publics, academics, K-12, um, archives, museums, historical societies, really anything and everything that has a, anything to do with libraries. That's really our only criteria that it's library focused. Um, and we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. So you should be able to find something for you on our show. Uh, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations, do sessions for us for things that we're doing here locally or in Nebraska or at, through the Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers as we have um, this morning. Um, on the line with us is uh, all from the Fort Worth, Texas Public Library is Amanya Shore. Good morning, Amanya. The library director there. Yeah, Marilyn Marvin and Tracy Lane. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. And um, Maya is actually, um, she's formerly was here in Nebraska a while ago. <laughs> uh, she was at um, one of our libraries here uh, for a long time and has gone on to other great things. Now being director here in, there in Fort Worth, that's awesome. <laughs> Um, and they're going to talk about how they did this great uh, new, uh, even though they're a large city and a large library, how did they did a tiny library there. So I'll just hand it over to you guys to um, take it away. Great. Thank you, Krista. Hi, everyone. My name is Manya Shore, and I'm the director of the Fort Worth Public Library. Let's see if I can switch screens. Hopefully, you all saw that switch as I did it. Someone will let me know if that, if that did not work. But let's start with an introduction of the panel. So as I said, my name is Manya, and Kristen, Krista, um, she revealed my secret. I spent five non-consecutive years working at the Omaha Public Library, and uh, I love Omaha. I miss it. It was, a, it was a great experience. I know not everyone here is in Nebraska, but I did just want to give a shout out to the Omaha Public Library. This is my 23rd year working in public libraries and my fifth large urban library system. Uh, aside from, from Omaha, I've worked at Multnomah County Library in Portland, Oregon, Sacramento Public Library in California, and most recently I was at the DC Public Library in the District of Columbia. And today we want to give you a revised version of a presentation that we gave at the PLA conference in Nashville, the last work-related trip that uh, I took, certainly, and that many of us took. So let me uh, hand it over to Tracy Lane to introduce herself to you today. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tracy Lane, and I am a LA library assistant with the Fort Worth Public Library. And I am going to be over the new, formerly known as Cambridge Court, now Rise Public Library. Uh, I've been with the Fort Worth Public Library for over 24 years now and just worked my way up the ranks from Paige to where I am now. It's been a wonderful experience and I'm glad to be here with you guys. And Marilyn, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marilyn Marvin. Uh, I am the assistant library director of system-wide services so the areas i am over things not pu direct public service related so i'm over communications hr it facilities um, data and statistics and budget finance um, i have only been with libraries here at the city of fort worth uh, since 2016 
Um, my background is IT and I got a great opportunity to come over to the library and as Manya likes to say, I have become a librarian. So it's great to be here this morning. Honorary librarian. <laughs> Yes, I think I call it a, a, a librarian by association. You know how it is, everyone. We we draw them in and then they're mm -hmm. converts for life. But I will say Marilyn's not giving herself enough credit. Uh, prior to working at the library, she was part of a neighborhood association that, that fought very hard for a new library in her neighborhood. So she's been a library lover and user for a very long time. Okay, so what we want to talk to you about today is a project that uh, we worked on in Fort Worth that, you know, it's not unusual to open a new library, uh, but we, what we want to talk to you about today is a little bit of, uh, around um, why we fought for this library and how we think that this can translate to, to any city and any library across the country, especially when you're talking about um, being successful through through working the political channels. So that's a little bit of a heads up. So first of all, because one of the things I learned when I moved to Fort Worth is that uh, nobody knows anything about Fort Worth and, and, and they think that uh, Fort Worth is Dallas and Dallas is Fort Worth. So I wanna spend a little bit of time just orienting everyone who's not in Texas to Fort Worth. Uh, Fort Worth is the 13th largest city in the country pretty high up there. It's much, much bigger than you think it is. This is actually, think up to date, 910,000 people. We are actually going to be bigger than Dallas in a couple of years. So it's, it's the, as our mayor likes to say, it's the unfortunate DFW uh, order. It could have easily been SWD, and then people would understand how big Fort Worth is. We're a relatively large landmass, 350 square miles, not as big as some county libraries across the country. But that is how our growth is happening. It's happening in sprawl. We don't have a ton of density because to the north, south, and west of us, there's nothing but land. And so as we grow, we are growing in those directions. To the east, of course, is Dallas. So we're, we're landlocked in that direction. And then uh, we have 15 library locations. That's not nearly enough for the population we serve or the size of our city something that we're working on and something that was in the back of my mind as we talked about this new location that we're going to present to you today. We have about a $22 million budget and a little over uh, 22, uh, 200 staff. This is the breakdown of Fort Worth, the city, and then we're going to talk about a specific neighborhood. So we are a minority majority city. And um, we have a medium household income of about 60,000, which is slightly higher than the state of Texas, but on track with the rest of the country. And then the family income uh, is a little lower than the state of Texas. As with so many large cities, we have a gap between the very wealthy and the very poor. But really what I want you to understand about Fort Worth, which is, is really happening across the state of Texas, but I, I'm not sure that people outside of the state understand the growth that's happening here and how big our cities really are. I didn't understand it until I moved here. So what I want you to see is our growth since 1960 and how quickly we have grown since uh, the year 2000. We have approximately 20,000 new people moving to Fort Worth per year. That's a lot of people <laughs> per year. That is a huge number of people. And so as you can imagine, the city has been grappling with this rate of growth for a long time. And you can see that when you look at how few libraries we have um, in the newer areas of growth, which is not something we're gonna get into in this presentation, but impacts us uh, and our ability to serve our public on a daily basis. Just to orient you a little bit to Fort Worth, so you can see to the east is Dallas. And like I said, we are landlocked. But then if you look west and north and south, you can see, I mean, there's little towns, but those are being annexed into Fort Worth. Uh, we are pretty far north. We're only about 
what, Marilyn, two and a half hours from the Oklahoma border, something like that, maybe less, maybe more like an hour and a half from the Oklahoma border. An hour and a half. So, so yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty far north, which no one told me before I moved here, which means that it's uh, relatively cold here in February. It's not, it's not Nebraska cold, but it's a little colder than I thought I was going to get when I moved to Texas. Um, snow? Is so, there snow? <laughs> well, we had, well, okay, we had, so Tracy's nodding and Marilyn's nodding, but I'll tell you, we had snow <laughs> over the weekend. We had Texas snow. I, I mean, mean yeah, there were flakes coming from the sky, but they barely stuck. Although I'll say outside of the city, I think they stuck a little bit more than they did really? than they did where I live. Yeah. Um, so one last thing I'll say about this map before I move on. If you notice, and I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, but if you notice this highway of 820, that is the loop that's called the loop of 820. The vast majority of our branches are inside the loop. We only have four locations outside of the loop. And when you look at how big the city is outside of that loop, it really highlights how much we're underserving our new areas of growth. And that does lead into uh, what we're gonna talk about with our location in Las Vegas Trail. Okay, so Krista, Oh, there. So this is the area of town. Sorry, I forgot there was a, a flying graphic. Um, this is the area of town that we're going to talk about today. It's an area called Las Vegas Trail. Um, don't be deceived by the name. It's not flashy. It's not nice. It is one of the most economically depressed uh, areas in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and you notice that it's on the eastern end. And that's, that'll be an important part of what we talk about going forward. Okay, so um, this is the moment that Krista should should get her the video ready. But as she's doing that, uh, let me just talk through the the demographics of uh, the trail, Las Vegas Trail. It's not enormous. There's only about eleven thousand residents. Of course, that's a moving number. It's a lot of rental properties. Uh, it's quite a young area with the median age being about 29 years old. But what I want you to notice is that 60% of the residents are considered very low income and that the majority of residents are renters. And with that, we'd like to show you a video that will really help you understand the Las Vegas Trail area. And Krista is going to help okay. uh, set that up so you can hear the audio. You should see it. There we go. Poverty is a big issue at this school because we are in the area we are. A lot of our parents are just trying to survive or have come from the poverty cycle themselves. I mean, if you drive, you just look out your window, you, could, you see the drugs and you see the violence. It terrifies me. I want to take them all home, but I can't. I do see a high rate of abuse in all of its different forms. Mental abuse, emotional abuse uh, is prevalent as well as physical abuse. And then we have quite um, often sexual abuse as well that we have to handle. We see kids arriving to school hungry. We see kids arriving um, underdressed. In the morning, the biggest problem is taking care of those basic needs. Um, so when we see our kids walk in, we realize, all right, it's time to help these kids feel nourished. This is their safe place. But out on the streets, it's very different because they're, they're surviving. There's a lot of students who pick up their four, five, and six-year-old siblings down at the primary, and then they all walk home when they try to read. And you, you look at them and you say, you're a fourth grader. You should be able to read this very well. But then you have to understand from where they came and why, hey, they might not be fed to every night. They're dealing with surviving every night or getting to a safe place every night or finding the next meal um, or hopping home. Quite frequently, the kids come to me and disclose, we were evicted last night, we're living in the car. And that's when we, we get them to the correct resource. And a lot of the resources, unfortunately, do a drug test. And quite frequently, our parents cannot pass that drug test, and therefore, 
cannot get that service, which then keeps that child out of a home in, in the park. Just teaching them the basic social skills and understandings of life, conflict management, of anger management. The example at home is, I'm angry, versus I'm frustrated, I need a second, give me a minute, and then the parent coming back. The hope is that we ignite within our students the new idea of a different style of life. So that's the beginning, giving them that hope that, hey, there's something different out there. The Kimball in the modern, we take our fourth graders and fifth graders and to see their eyes go, wow, this is neat. And it's a whole new perspective. Their eyes have been opened. These kids need somebody to invest in them because they have known neglect and abandonment. They deserve love just as much as anybody else. Until we can come together and stop this cycle of violence and drugs, we're going to continue to battle this. But to battle on, I mean, we have to. So as I'm getting my screen back, that was a little choppy for me. So I don't know if it was choppy for everyone else, but I hope that you got the the gist. I know because that's always how it is, Krista. You know, Krista and I knew we were uh, taking a risk showing you a video, but I think it really helps illustrate what the community looks like. Um, and when we do so, the record, yeah. we put up the archive, I'll put a link to that video as well. So if anybody does want to oh, go and okay. watch themselves again, you'll be able to um, see it. Okay, great. So now I want to flip a little bit away from Las Vegas Trail and talk to you about why I thought it was important that we focus on Las Vegas Trail as a potential service area. Obviously, there's a need, but as the library director, I believe that part of my role is to think higher than just the immediate need. And one of the reasons Tracy is here today is to talk to you about uh, serving the community directly. But for me, when I got here in September of 2017, I set up meetings with all the city council members and the council member over this district, uh, he has our, our busiest library in his district. He at the time had two and all he, okay, so let me flip to the next slide because this will, this will illustrate to you what it was like to meet with him. Uh, this is a direct quote from council member Brian Bird when I met with him in the fall of 2017. After this, he asked me about pornography on library computers. And that was pretty much our entire conversation with him telling me he doesn't use the library and asking about access to pornography. Uh, now, I learned later that his wife runs a nonprofit that tries to combat sex trafficking. So I understand now where that question came from. But at the time, I left, and Marilyn knows this, I left that meeting thinking, oh, man, we have a challenge in front of us. This guy doesn't even know that he has the busiest library in his district, and he doesn't seem to care. And we have to get past this with him. So I started thinking about what's important to him. And I think this is where it gets a little, sometimes people feel like this is where it gets a little dirty, right? Because our sole focus should be on helping the community. And I believe that's true, but we can only help the community sometimes when we play the political game successfully. And so our problem at the library is not just this particular council member. And I feel bad saying negative things about him at this point because we've, Things have changed so much since I put this presentation together, but uh, I'll get to that later. But it's good. To, um, it's you, know, you need to understand where things started, and because I'm sure many people have this. Oh, this is so common, unfortunately, in many communities. Large yeah, I think that's. Small. I think that's fair. And the preview is he's now running for mayor, and I'm so glad that we put all this time and energy into him because I think that's going to pan out well for us. But. But back awesome. to the fall of 2017 when things felt uh, kind of like a dead end with him. And as I was looking at 
uh, the library. So what I want you to notice here is on the far left, it says Walsh Ranch Parkway. And then the map ends on the right at the Ridgely Library. The Ridgely Library, and remember, we're still in that eastern part or that western part of the city, and there's the loop of 820 about halfway through. The Ridgely Branch was opened in 1967 and renovated in 2012, and it is our westernmost location. However, the city goes all the way to that Walsh Ranch Parkway. That is a new development. And um, at this point, the end of the city, but guaranteed to not be the actual end. The city will continue to annex closer and closer to Marilyn's house, <laughs> despite her, her wishes. Um, and the growth will just keep happening uh, in, towards the West, maybe even all the way to California. Um, so we have a problem. We have people who are uh, 15 miles west of our westernmost branch. This Ridgely Library is in that same council member's district. So we have an access issue in his district that he doesn't really know about. But what he does care about, and what I learned in the fall of 2017, is he cares about the Las Vegas Trail area. And he helped form this nonprofit called LVT Rise, Las Vegas Trail Rise, which was to help improve the lives of people living in Las Vegas Trail. So after that, when I realized that, uh, sort of this became my goal, right? Get Brian Bird, Council Member Brian Bird, to advocate and become a champion for the library by putting something in his area that he cares about that will then bleed over into everything else in his district, the other two libraries, which are so important, and to get him to stop saying to me, my family doesn't use the library, although I don't care if his family uses the library or not, but I wanted to get away from the spirit of what he was saying to me mm -hmm. in that first meeting. And I think for many so people, now I, something that they have to understand, it's okay if your family doesn't, but other people do. And as someone in your position, it's your job to be aware of that. It's something that people do use and need support. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's always helpful when they're library users because they understand how it works. But I think that Pew showed us with their decade long study that uh, people don't have to use us to be supporters. And so I don't, I don't focus on that. Um, but it's really what he was saying to me with that statement that I'm trying to get away from. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Marilyn to talk about uh, our the solution we came up with at the time. Okay, so as Manya said, we focused on the Las Vegas Trail area because that was absolutely important to Brian Bird, and our westernmost branch was Ridgely. While Las Vegas Trail isn't that much further west, it is further west, and especially in this communicating uh, communi community where transportation is problematic, it made a lot of sense. And so, as Manya said, killing two birds with one stone, um, this became our solution. Um, we, before I start about where the solution where we put this little bitty library, um, things to remember. And I won't take very long because what you really wanna hear is Tracy and the impact that this little library made. Um, so, I, so I'll be quick, but it's important when you're looking at ways to stand up a small library or a large library, it's important to remember a couple of things. You always need to have partners. You need to make sure you have all the right people in the room. You need to know your audience. And you need to obviously know a timeline and a budget. So for us, our timeline was less than three months. That's not very long to stand up a little library, but that's how important it was for us for the reasons Manya's already mentioned. We were very fortunate in the partner uh, avenue 
we had two great partners to help us do this. We had the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Tarrant County, that the county that the city of Fort Worth is in, and we had the Fort Worth Library, Public Library Foundation. Our budget was extremely small, which we got completely from the foundation. We had $22,000, and our little library was 450 square feet. So extremely small and you think in your head, how in the world can we provide any services in 450 square feet? But we did uh, on a budget of 22,000. In fact, we didn't even use the whole 22,000. We Sarah had to- mm -hmm. Sorry, do you want me to start flipping through the pictures? Uh, not, not quite yet, but I'll let you okay. know. You tell me when, okay. Yep. Um, so we didn't even, we uh, had $2,000 left in our budget. We met our, uh, we had our first meeting on January 7th of 2019. And we had our grand opening on March 21st of 2019. Um, and it's all due to the hard work of the team, the library team and the partners who helped us. So you can go ahead. So our, um, you can flip Manya. So Cambridge Court is an apartment complex. It spans across the street and it has two clubhouses and the Boys and Girls Club had one of those, uh, one of the clubhouses was not being used. And so the Boys and Girls Club was using two thirds of that clubhouse for their after school programming. And we partnered with them to use a third and so you can see in this slide, there were two rooms that they were not using. And we came in and said, we can make this, we can make this work. Now our initial was we were going to segment the library into uh, two rooms. One was about 250 square feet and the other is 200 square feet. And the great partnership we had with the Boys and Girls Club, they said, why don't we just tear down a wall and we'll cover the expense so when i say it's extremely important to have great partners so if you want to flip manya to the next slide oops that's not this is what they did for us they took out the middle wall and we had one great big room big room i say 450 square feet but it was bigger than two little rooms and most of our budget was not used on furniture. All this, the, the shelving, everything you see here, we went to other branches in our, uh, in the system and we pilfered because we had $22,000 and we wanted most of that to go to the collection so that and to public computers. So in this 450 square feet, we had five public computers. We had uh, a great collection. These, uh, where those, those tables are, where the public computers are. If you'll see on this picture to the left, there's a, um, it, what it is is an old book drop. We did not use it as a book drop, but that's where we put one of the public computers. We used every square inch of this 450 square feet. Um, you can go to the next one, Manya. So grand opening day, uh, we, um, there were two entrances or there were two doors to this clubhouse. One was for the Boys and Girls Club, one was for us. And it was pretty exciting. Um, one of the things I would say when I mentioned know your audience, we really thought, and Tracy will talk about this in a few minutes, we really thought because transportation is problematic, that the people that use this little library would come from the apartment complex and nowhere else, maybe a block away. But when Tracy talks, we, we were quite surprised at where people came from for this little bitty 450 square foot library. And so it was uh, pretty exciting. But March 21st, our grand opening day, and right there cutting the ribbon is Council Member Brian Bird, who 
truly was. Manya did a great job in, in him seeing the value of opening up a library. And to her point, it was extremely important that we place this library in an area that was important to Brian Bird. Um, next, and these are just pictures of what it looked like when we did the grand opening, public computers. The next slide shows the collection. Um, it, when I say we use every square inch, we use every square inch. And Tracy can tell you about how she used everything. So now, without further ado, Miss Tracy Lane. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I want to point out the little lady in the pink bathrobe because she's very important. I'm going to introduce you to her shortly. Um, but so this is uh, this was Cambridge Court Library opening day. Um, and as Marilyn said, a uh, pleasant surprise that we had, we were expecting a lot of people from the immediate community. There are over 40 um, apartment complexes within this square area. Uh, but there were a lot of people that came from all over the city that were just curious about, what is this Cambridge Court Library? Where did y'all come from? So we had a lot of people that were visiting just to find out what we were about. Um, these wonderful people that were in the slide previously to that were Danny and Andrea. Um, Danny is a longtime Fort Worth Public Library user. Um, he was formerly homeless, but in coming to the library, he was able to get in touch with a lot of people and get connected to resources. Um, he now has an apartment. He actually lives right next door uh, to the apartment complex of Cambridge Court. And this is his lovely wife, Andrea, and they have been longtime um, for public library supporters. As soon as they found out I was next door, they've been hanging with me ever since. So they've been definitely uh, one of our favorites and our um, one of our well-loved library supporters. Um, in the next slide we have here, uh, the lady that is at the table signing up for a library card is the same lady uh, from the pink with the pink bathrobe. Uh, that is Miss uh, Manuela Perez. Um, she is also a longtime tenant of the Cambridge Court Apartments. Um, I had a wonderful, developed a wonderful relationship with her. Um, she has an awesome story. Um, she's a cancer survivor. Um, she also hosted Bible study in her apartment complex. And she was also looked at and referred to as like the grandmother of the complex. Um, as was mentioned before, a lot of the tenants and people in the community are very young. Um, there are a lot of um, hard situations that they go through. She's the go-to for the complex. They call her the abuelita of the complex. And she's really precious and wonderful. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, right here, this um, these statistics mark the first 100 days at Cambridge Court Library. Um, we opened, the average attendance is 32 uh, people. Uh, within that first 90 days, we had 3,053 people walk through those doors. I felt every bit of it. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience. Um, we normally have, um, it's usually about, as you can see, 401 teens. 160, uh, oh, 401 youth, uh, 160 teens. Uh, most of those numbers are from working in conjunction with the Las Vegas Trail Boys and Girls Club as we were sharing the building. Uh, I worked very closely with them and we intertwined and worked on many programs to keep the kids busy and enriched and en uh, encouraged and uh, educated. Uh, we have over 247 adults um, I had a, quite a few adults. That was another surprise as well. Uh, we were expecting more children from the community because I also have a lot of um, schools that are in the surrounding area. But we had a lot of adults come and visit Cambridge Court. Uh, many of them were coming to sign up for social services, uh, look for jobs. Um, I also had college students as well on the undergraduate and graduate level that would come daily to do their assignments and all of that. Um, we also had um, over 49, 4,916 items were checked out. 
I felt every bit of that too. <laughs> but it was wonderful. But just to give you just a breakdown in the day to day of Cambridge Court, I would describe it as controlled chaos. Um, I will have a couple of littles in one corner working with the magnetiles. I'll have students doing their homework. I have adults at the computers doing their homework or signing up for social services. And it was all one big happy family. Of course, as you know, working with a lot of children at the time, uh, the Boys and Girls Club had over 100 children registered. We had the littles the, um, between three to five and the teens from six to eight. So as you imagine, a lot of chaos. Uh, but we had a lot of support from the community um, and the adults didn't mind too much. They were just glad the kids had somewhere to come in a positive uh, environment to be in. These lovely people right here are April and Dakota Alberts. Um, they are or were longtime residents of Cambridge Court Library. Um, Dakota has um, many health ailments, one of them being he has vision impairment. Um, he lost his sight as he got older. Uh, Dakota is in his uh, mid-20s at this time right now. Uh, his mother, April, is his caretaker. Um, and growing up, she developed a love of reading for him. Um, he was above picture books and um, board books. She would read Shakespeare to him. Until this very day, even though he has his sight is impaired, he can recite to you different stanzas, stanzas and poetry and plays from Shakespeare from memory. So they were very glad when we moved uh, open cameras court. Uh, they were also had issues with transportation, so they weren't able to get to the other libraries. This was their connection and they were just overcome with emotion when we opened up that they feel finally connected. Um, they were uh, great supporters of ours and continue to do so. Um, through working and coming to the library, they were able to get other resources together. And April is now a first time homeowner. So they are doing well now. And our next slide, this is my little lady here. This is the lady in the pink bathrobe. This is Manuela Perez. And we wanted to show you this picture because um, her daughter dyed her hair pink because they had just realized, they had just found out that once again, she has survived cancer. There was no evidence of it. So she dyed her hair pink to celebrate and commemorate the occasion. Uh, but man, beautiful pink hair, I love it. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So another thing is uh, with Manuela Perez, she would also come to the library and use our database resources to study for her GED. Um, I know a lot of seniors are kind of skittish sometimes about using technology in the computers. Um, we eased into that process and she became a pro at it. So, and she's continuing to work on that um, to this day. And the next slide. I think that is it, Tracy. Yes. I can take it from here. All right. I just want to jump in and, and remind everyone, um, uh, if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to ask of uh, Tracy or um, on your Maryland, um, type it into your questions section. We'll ask them at any time. Um, and we'll make sure we get through everybody's questions if you have them. Uh, we do, we're not anywhere near the end of the show. I'll tell you, I didn't want anyone to panic, but um, even though we officially are at 11, 10 to 11 a.m. time, um, if you have questions, comments, we're still having discussions, we'll keep going as long as um, everyone um, needs to until we have everyone's questions answered. So do type into the questions section there anything you want to know more about. Great, thank you, Krista, and thank you, Tracy. I hope what you all see is, is why we chose Tracy for this assignment. Uh, she is just the perfect person to work in that community. And it's, you know, we're not going to talk really about COVID today. I don't think it's particularly germane to this project. But I will mention that when we closed the, all the libraries in mid-March, we, of course, closed Cambridge Court as well. And we've never reopened it because it's just so small that Tracy would really only be able to have one person in there with her. And so we decided just to wait until we opened in the new location. So uh, Tracy hasn't been with her, her peeps out there since March of 2020. But, and here is the new part of this presentation since PLA, which is to talk about why this matters. Again, obviously it matters because of the work that Tracy is doing and the need in the community. 
But for me, the long-term goal was always to have a permanent library in Las Vegas Trail that Brian Bird, council member Brian Bird, asked for. So the entire time I was willing to permanently close Cambridge Court if we did not have the funding to continue or, and this is what I haven't mentioned before, LVT Rise, that nonprofit that uh, Brian Burt is the board chair of, uh, purchased an old YMCA building. Uh, I can't remember what it was called. My apologies. I don't think it matters. But you can see how close it is. So Cambridge Court and the new LVT Rise Community Center are 0.1 miles away. And it had always been planned that LVT would renovate this old YMCA that you see here and stand up a community center. And the Boys and Girls Club, which they were with us at Cambridge Court, they were gonna move over to their new permanent location inside this new community center. Tracy, if it wasn't, if you didn't catch this from everything she was saying, she was the sole staff person at the Cambridge Court Library. She was all by herself. And so I she know, matched, I did, uh, did have someone asking about like who all else worked there and how did that all? <laughs> so she was alone, but don't worry, she wasn't actually alone. We matched the hours of the YM, of the Boys and Girls Club. So she was only there uh, with the door unlocked for the public when they were also there in case something happened. And that was for security reasons. So she was alone, but she wasn't, she wasn't alone in case of an emergency, but she was the sole library staff person at Cambridge Court. So when the Boys and Girls Club moved out and into their permanent home here at the Y, uh, Tracy would actually be all alone, and we were prepared to close the Cambridge Court Library permanently. However, my hope was always that we would prove success and that there would be a clamor for us to also move into this community center. I did not think it would happen in the first phase because the Boys and Girls Club was scheduled to go in what they're calling construction phase two. However, one day, and this must have been at the end of 2019, I um, inserted myself, this, I do this a lot, there were these Las Vegas Trail meetings at City Hall that I was not invited to but found out were happening and I just started going to them. And they were with the council member and I would sit on the outside and I talked to my assistant city manager and I said, I'm going to start going to these. And he said, okay, but don't make any promises and don't talk because you're not part of this project and we don't have any funding for you to be a part of it. And so one day I was at one of these meetings sitting on the outside, not at the table. And one, they were talking about the phasing and the construction and what they were going to put in this community center. And all of a sudden, it happened. The chief of staff for council member Brian Bird said, why aren't we having a library in there? Uh -huh. And just like that, everything changed. And Brian, council member Bird turned and looked at me and he said, yeah, why don't we have a library in there? And then everyone started talking about having a library in there. And that's when I said, oh, we'd love to be a part of this project. <laughs> and it snowballed from there. So now uh, I'll turn it over to Marilyn to talk about our transition into this, this new community center with our permanent branch library. Yay. <laughs> so it is extremely exciting. Again, um, partnering has been fantastic for us and that Brian Bird has now come to realize how fantastic libraries are. Um, and what Manya said was originally we thought, so there's a building behind the building you see on the slide. We thought we were gonna be part of phase two, which would be in that the building that you can't see. And as this transpired, we became part of phase one. And so now we are inside this building and we've doubled in size. Tracy's nice. so excited. Instead of 450 square feet, we're 900 square feet. It is two rooms. 450 square feet is still the library portion, but now we have a computer room. And so if you want to go to the next slide, Manya. 
uh, well, that is what it's going to look like. Uh, that's a conceptual drawing of after they get all the construction done and the front entrance. This is also a conceptual drawing. Uh, so the library, and you'll see it here in just a second, but uh, is there in the middle. You'll see the shelving there on the right. Mm -hmm. And I think the next slide is actual and that's our library so that's before the furniture arrived again partnerships are so fantastic so the fort worth public library foundation graciously again bought all of our furniture um, and so when you see um, it's we are ready to go um, next slide manya there's all of our furniture um what's super exciting is that we've also stood this up pretty quickly as well um i mean the construction part took a while but when it was time for us to start moving in we have really stood things up pretty quickly we are this week which money doesn't have pictures of this but this week the the city of fort worth network is will be live today actually this afternoon we're moving all the computers the hardware that were at cambridge court they've been sitting there since march um are moving on uh tomorrow so and i know that part of the collection showed up yesterday i believe and we will be ready to open our new permanent location which is still in the same area as Cambridge Court. So our residents don't have to walk any further. Well, maybe a little further, but not very far. Tracy will still get to see everyone. Um, our hope is, not our hope, but we plan on opening the 21st of this month. Super exciting to have a permanent location for the residents of Las Vegas Trail. I think there's a, is there another slide, Manya? Oh, that, um, we have our barn door. That's the entrance into the computer room from the actual library location. And that is our little computer room. We will have laptops. Those are not there yet, but we'll have laptops for uh, the public to use during training. And Tracy will have another staff member. She will not be by herself. Yay. <laughs> staff member. <laughs> so it's very exciting. And this is a community space that's inside the community center that we're going to be able to use for programming. So not only is our library bigger, but we'll have space to program in if Tracy wants to do some large scale programming. So we're not confined to just the 450 square feet. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the last one. So I'll take it back from here. I, I was going to to let everyone know that Tracy has support, so she's not going to be all alone. We're going to be going from 30 hours to 40 hours. I will tell you that uh, I was unsuccessful in getting more funding for additional staff so that we could mirror the hour, our normal hours at the rest of our locations, which is predominantly six days a week and about 12 hours a day. We're not at that right now with COVID, of course, but um, we will get back there. I don't have the, the staff or the funding. Um, and I think it's really, I'm just gonna continue to work on getting that. Uh, some things that have happened in the last week is that our mayor says she's not gonna run again. So council member Brian Bird is running for mayor and his chief of staff, the one who turned to me and said, why don't we have a library? He's now running for the council seat that Brian is vacating. So I have all of these lessons learned from here, but really what I, I wanna say two main things to everyone is that that one is I think it's really important that we as, as, as library staff, that we, when we have those initial encounters with decision makers and stakeholders that seem negative, that we don't let that get to us. I see that happen so often that people get really upset. Why doesn't he understand? Why don't we have enough money? Why, why don't we have all the political clout? Well, the reality is, is we don't. <laughs> and I don't know how to, uh, how to say that any, any differently, but with some people, we just don't have the cachet that we need. 
uh, or that we should have. And, and getting upset and getting defensive doesn't really get you anywhere. And I, I think that, yes, this took almost three years to get to this point, but I'm playing the long game here. Mm -hmm. And if, if Brian Bird wins mayor, that's only good for all of the work that we've been doing, the three of us and everyone else in the library has been doing around making sure that he understands how important the library is in this community. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, we're hearing a lot around COVID, don't waste a good crisis. I think this is really true. Uh, the reason we didn't really have to talk about COVID with this project is because it didn't stop moving forward. I mean, yeah, we all took a little pause in, in March and April, but um, we've been moving forward on this project this entire time. And that's the only reason that we're able to open uh, this month. And, and you, can, you, can, you can be sure I just remembered I was being recorded on a public webinar. Um, <laughs> you see me augment my language. You can be sure that when we open the doors to this new library, there is going to be a ribbon cutting and mayoral candidate Brian Bird is going to be there. And mm -hmm. we're going to walk him through it. And because he's running for mayor, there's probably going to be press there that wouldn't have been there normally. And so it's all because of, of um, sitting at the table, forcing yourself to the table, not getting upset, and then of course, putting the right person like Tracy uh, in the space to do such incredible work with the community that we're as successful uh, as we are. And so that is our project and, and we're, we're so proud of it. And thank you all so much for coming today. Um, yeah, you should be that. Uh, that was awesome. Yeah, I mean, the the new location is going to be amazing. But even the old, the first one was a, just a, a miracle and awesome that you did that. Um, I do have some questions coming in. Um, so if you, anybody does have questions, we still have um, officially like five ish minutes till 11 o'clock, but we'll go, as I said, as long as it takes, we do not get cut off right at 11 a.m. Although as long as people are discussing, asking questions, answering questions for you guys, however, um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Manya and Marilyn and Tracy. This was this was awesome. Great to hear about this tiny library in a big city. And this is the kind of thing that I think people need to. It's thinking outside the box and doing that advocacy for the libraries, advocacy and persistence and uh, networking. It's something we just gotta. We all just gotta keep doing for our libraries. Um. Uh. So. You're opening, doing a grant opening, grand opening on January 21st. Are is are you guys opening to for actual business? Or is there still restrictions due to COVID to for everything across the city? Is that so? That's going to be kind of open, but <laughs> well, so we're different than a lot of places around the country. We have had half of our locations with doors open to the public since June. So. Uh, we have currently eight locations that are open to the public. Uh, Tracy, I believe, is sitting in one of them right now. She's at the Ridgely branch, I think. And so we're limited hours. We're Tuesday through Saturday when normally we'd be six days a week. And we have limited occupancy. And of course, we're doing temperature checks and screening questions and masks required. But I'll tell you, um, I'm so proud that we've been open. We're the only large library system in Texas that has doors open to the public. And we have about approximately 20,000 people a month walking into our eight locations, which is, of course, a tiny fraction of our normal gate count for a month. But it's still, and we have curbside everywhere. So the curbside is an option and people are still choosing to come in our doors. So when we say open, we mean open. Um, I don't know, Tracy, I assume we've talked to occupancy limits for the space, but I don't know what they are. Do you? So the occupancy limits for rides will be three patrons for now. Okay. Yeah. And that's just starting out. And so we officially open the computer room portion and get that going. But just starting out, it's going to be three patrons at a time. Sounds good. All right. Um, we have a couple of questions that came in earlier that had to do with how yeah, the um, working at the library staff areas, uh, um, like uh, managing the library worked with the previous location, which I think though will feed into now your new one. So I think the questions are just fine. So uh, are there any, I didn't see anything in the pictures, but 
are there any staff work areas there um, for like managing incoming materials and things like that at the location or is that done elsewhere and then how's that all handled? <laughs> I mean, there's there's a shared kitchen, I believe, at the new community center that Tracy can use. There are shared bathrooms, so those kind of opportunities. But um, mm -hmm. no, Tracy's going to process right right in the uh, in the library. You want to? Yeah, y'all 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 pretty much saw where yeah, the magic is going to happen. Location, you had to just work in the area, at work in the space. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but they are going. They do have a um, community office. If I do need to use it for meetings or anything with a uh, uh, staff or, or the community that will be available to me. But y'all pretty much saw where all the magic is going to happen. This is, I mean, for us in Nebraska, and Manya would know that, or anyone who's been in a rural uh, state, that's like our some of our ind individual independent public libraries. There is, it's a one big building or one, not even big, one building, one room, and that's it. There isn't a staff area behind the scenes through a door. It is what it is. Yeah. So to me, that's very um, reminiscent and common. <laughs> but I know people yeah. in other larger cities may think, well, no, there's got to be a staff area. You go back here to do your technical processing and your catalog. No, no. You do that uh, well, when, you, when, you, do when someone needs help, you stop what you're doing and you help them, and then yeah, a lot of multitasking. Yeah, and, <laughs> you know, we're because we're a large library system. Tracy's not going to do any cataloging or technical processing. I mean, what we're talking about with what Tracy is going to do is check in, check out, um, sure, shelves. I mean, it's it's you know that's what happens at all of our branches. We don't do all that stuff is centralized for us. Sure. Sure. Um, and another question came in. Did you do at the previous location and will you at this one do any sort of interlibrary loan of sharing um, materials because you know, do, or did the immediate collection in the building meet everyone's needs, which they never really do, but <laughs> We did uh, offer and have access to interlibrary loan, and I had quite a few patrons that actually took advantage of that. Also, in addition to our uh, forward public libraries, we had uh, what we call our Metropac libraries, which we exchange materials with as well. So whatever I didn't have on site, I was able to order and get materials for the patrons that way. From other branches in the city? Yes. yes. Nice. We have a, she's talking about a consort, we have a consortial agreement oh. with, I think, four or five other cities that touch borders with Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we have 14 other locations and we have a healthy enough budget that I would think for the most part, folks could just place hold and pick them up at, at uh, the Cambridge Court Library and wouldn't need to do interlibrary loan quite as much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Because you've got so many, so many resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I might have missed this. Um, is the name of this one going to be the same name coming over, or you got a new name for the location? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. But now that we know we're opening very soon, we should probably figure that out. Um, <laughs> we, I, I like to say that at, we. Everyone knows who works at the Fort Worth Public Library knows that my mantra is we do things slow and right and not fast and wrong. That's really important to me. However, sometimes things happen quickly and we have to adjust. And um, I mean, I think it's probably Rise, Rise Community Library or Rise Library. Did, Tracy's nodding. Did we already pick it and I've forgotten? Uh, yeah, I believe it's Rise. Rise because of the location that it's at. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Rise Library? Is that what it's called? should probably mm -hmm. know that. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Rise Library. Awesome. And that's not an acronym for anything. It's just Rise. No. Right, because it's the area. Yeah. All right. Um, any other cool desperate, desperate questions anybody wants to ask? That's everything that we had. I just asked there. Um, we're a little after 11 o'clock, so we can wrap up if we want to. But if anybody has anything desperate you want to ask of them, uh, get it in now. But I'm sure you can always reach out to Tracy, um, Mani, and Marilyn if you do have other uh, future questions. Um, as I said, we are recording uh, the slides here. Um, Mani, if you email those to me, I can include them in the record in the archive page as well. So we'll have a link to the slides. Um, we'll have a link to that video too that I had shared earlier. So you'll be able to watch that um, if you didn't if you didn't come through clearly through our recording. Sometimes, yeah, doing these things online, you just, it, it is what it is, but we'll have a link to it for you. Yeah.
Well, thank you so much for having us, Chris, yeah. Krista, and, and the Nebraska Library Commission, and, and thank you to everyone. We're really proud of this project. If you ever come to Fort Worth, let us know. We'd love to give you a tour. Yeah, definitely. When I can travel again, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was great to see you again, Mon. You know, like I said, like you said, this is a session from the um, PLA conference. Um, lot of, oftentimes at Encompass Live, I um, look out and see, looking to see what conferences have happened in person and um, help to spread the word about anything going on. And this one, of course, here, like I said, we've got a lot of rural. When I see tiny in the title of something, I'm like, ooh, and it catches my attention. Um, and then I saw Manya's name, and I'm like, oh, well, of course, I have to reach out to these guys. <laughs> Um, right. but was, yeah, so this is great. Thank you so much. Someone's saying thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, lots of great, useful information, I think, for everybody who may need to do something similar in, um, in their community, uh, large or small. Um, this is the kind of thing anyone can use, absolutely. All right, I am going to bring presenter control back to my screen. There we go, get the right one up there. There we go. All right. Um, so yes, as I said, we um, are recording and I'm going to pop back to our main Encompass Live page. If you do use your search engine of choice and just Google the name of our uh, show, Encompass Live, so far we're the only thing on the internet called that, so it'll just come up with our pages. No one else is ever allowed to use this name. <laughs> Um, and we've got our upcoming shows here, but right underneath is a link to our archives. This is where the um, today's show will be. Should be there by the end of the week with all the processing that needs to be done. It'll be at the top here, most recent ones at the top. We'll have a link to the recording on our YouTube channel, the slides, and the video that was there. Um, so everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show get an email from me letting you know when it is available. Uh, while we're here, I'll also show you, I talked earlier about how we have lots of topics and lots of shows and our archives are here. Uh, you can search our archives here for any topic you might be interested in and see if we've done a show about it. You can search the full archives or the most recent 12 months if you just want something really current. And that is because uh, this is the full archives of Encompass Live, but I'm not going to scroll all the way to the bottom because that'd be too far. Um, this is our archives going back to the beginning of the show. Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we're over 10 years and we've got all of our archives here going back to the very first show. Um, we are librarians, we archive things, keep them for historical purposes, so we'll always have them out here. But just pay attention if you are watching any of our archives to the original broadcast dates. You'll see that's on here. Um, some of our shows, many of our shows will stand the test of time, but some might not. Us, program services, uh, Websites may no longer exist, may have changed completely since when we first um, broadcast them. So just pay attention when you are watching them. But as I said, we are librarians. We're going to keep them up there as long as we have the uh, technical <laughs> capabilities to do it. We'll always keep our full archives available there. Um, we do also have a Facebook page. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. Um, we do reminders about uh, upcoming shows, who our presenters are, when our recordings are available. So uh, if you want to give us a like on Facebook, you can. We also use the NCUMP Live, a um, little abbreviated hashtag when we post on Instagram, Twitter, whatever other social medias we, we use. <laughs> um, so that wrapped up today's show. Next week, we are off next week. We're taking a week off. We did have a show originally scheduled for January 20th. We have chosen to um, push that off to a later date. Our One Book, One Nebraska for 2021, a book called Prairie Forge is being rescheduled to a date in probably February. Just check my email. We don't know yet. We're getting in with our speakers. So that will be in, Jan in February at some point. Um, so look here for an update to that. But next week, we're taking the week off. Um, and we'll be back on the last Wednesday of the month with our Pretty Sweet Tech, uh, uh, how to make tutorials in a screen recorder and webcam. So please do sign up for any of those upcoming shows. Uh, and one last little reminder I want to give is we also here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we do our weekly webinar series. We also host an annual online conference, Big Talk from Small Libraries. This is, as I mentioned, rural and small libraries doing presentations, talking about what they're doing. And our call for speakers was extended uh, through this Friday. So if you are a small or a rural library, uh, FT uh, population served, our FT of 10,000 or less, uh, put in a proposal and you can maybe uh, present on our Big Talk to Small Libraries. The actual conference is at the end of February. It's always the last Friday in February. So I just want to remind everyone to um, get your presentations in there. 
And otherwise, that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you guys all for being here, all of you being here with me this morning. This was great. I was glad to hear all about what you're doing. Um, and good luck. And um, I'm going to keep an eye on your website and what you're doing to see how your grand opening does. Um, maybe later on we can do an update on how things went um, in a year or so to see how, you know, check in with you all. <laughs> All right, so thank you everybody for being here this morning and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>